Good. So we're going to talk about adult learning this morning, and this really underpins the whole of the day. Um, we're not really leading into your um, knowledge about pet courses and that sort of stuff, but that will become apparent as you teach during the day, of course. You need to know the material if you're going to put yourself up there as an instructor. You need to know it inside out, back to front, upside down, because the people sitting in front of you will. So it's worth just thinking about that. Um, but I've got two aims for you, and that really is to talk about adult learning, just bring back some of those adult learning theories to the front of your brain that I, I expect you probably already know and are using on a daily basis, but I'll just give it some names. And you'll think, oh yes, that's the type of modality I'm using, and perhaps you'll learn something new. And also I'll let you know when you've relaxed. Uh, I did a doctorate three or four years ago about, about behavior in an educational setting, so body language for teachers. So I'll let you know when you've started to trust me and I'm learning to mind read as well, so that I'll let you know when you've relaxed completely. Okay, so that's my two main aims for you. So we're going to talk about adult learning and just bring back some of those things and why adults learn the way they do. So can everybody see that screen okay? Yeah? So adults learn by this list, by giving you some new knowledge, some new ideas, some new skills. You're going to pick up that knowledge, pick up the skill, and you'll learn by doing that. We're going to challenge you. Adults like to be challenged, but in the balance. Too much challenge and people fall off the edge, you know, get too stressed, etc. Too little challenge, people get bored. So it's got to be a balance. And education is not an exact science, guys. Adult learning is not an exact science. It's all about balance. Too much of one thing and the session goes horribly wrong. Too little, it can go horribly wrong. So if you get the balance right, you'll get a good learning session. And you'll hear me talk about the learner quite a lot here. This is not about us as teachers or instructors or as trainers. It's about the learner. If the learner comes into your room and walks out of your room after learning nothing, you've wasted their time. And if you waste your time and other people's time, it's a form of theft, isn't it? Yeah? So it's worth thinking about. Yeah? So there are three key principles of adult learning I'm going to give you in this next sort of 58 minutes. And there's the first one right at the very bottom. Applications. Can I apply this to my daily life? So I have a group of adults here this morning. You're adult learners this morning. I'm standing in front of you. Yeah? I need to be able to tell you that what we're going to give you today, you can use. It's applicable to you. Yeah? It's okay, it's okay. You're very welcome. Yeah? So how do I apply this to my daily life? If I said to you this morning, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to learn our five times table. What should be your reaction? Other than, woohoo, that's the easy one. Yeah? What should be your reaction this morning? Did I come here for this? Or even shorter, why? Yeah, absolutely, why? Because it's not really relevant to you this morning, to what you're expecting. You're expecting to be taught, hopefully, some teaching modalities that work very well for teaching the pet material. Yeah? We're not saying this fits all material, but it certainly fits teaching on pet courses, and EEG, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So we offer it to you. And we offer it to you because we know it works. And actually, you're going to get a chance to apply that today, and we're going to watch you. You've got some forms in your packs, which means that we're going to evaluate that teaching and give you some feedback on your teaching. And this may be the first time in many years you've done that. You've had that feedback. So it's a good development opportunity. And we'll do that, certainly do that for you. And we'll be honest with you about that. Yeah? So application, can I use it? And you've got to think about that with your group of learners when you go into that room. What's the hook? How do I get you interested in what I'm about to say? If you've just listened to three, four lectures, and I'm the fourth or fifth lecturer, how do I make it applicable to you? I've got to give you something that hooks you in. Does that make sense? Yeah? So you've got to think about that. It doesn't just happen. You can't make the assumption that I, you know why you're here. I would hope you do. You're a group of intelligent men and women, so I would hope you know why you're here. But sometimes you always don't. You don't always know. What's this session about? Etc. Yeah, so it's worth thinking about. And that second key principle that I've just touched on is relevance. How do I make it relevant to you? We're quite lucky today because you're all at the same level. So that's quite easy for me as a teacher. I know where the pitch level is. I know where to pitch it. But if you were a mixed group of people, consultants, let's say registrars, let's say, say some F2s, let's say some nursing staff, then the pitch has to be different levels sometimes. And sometimes it has to interchange during the session. So as a, an instructor, as a trainer, whatever you want to call yourself, you need to think about that. How can I adjust the pitch? How can I make it relevant for my audience? and consider that audience may be mixed. Yeah? So it's worth thinking about. Yeah? And sometimes, of course, because we take these courses abroad, English may not be the first language or second language sometimes. So again, you need to consider what words am I going to use? And this is where words and nonverbal communication really must match. 
And you, and you need to think about it as a teacher. Give it some thought. When was the last time you thought, how am I going to use my body during this teaching session? That's a question that I'll just leave hanging, shall I? Yeah? There's a few wry smiles I can see. Yeah? Okay, you don't have to answer that question. Okay. So learning's supposed to be dynamic, folks. It's a dynamic process. You're supposed to be dynamic. How dynamic are you feeling this morning? Really dynamic, uh, yeah. Andy, yeah. I can tell. Yeah? Because what it means is, guys, if you're interested and enthusiastic about your teaching, then that spills over into your candidates. It can't help. Enthusiasm is catching. It really is. Yeah? And in an adult education, you've got to have some sort of interaction going on. It's a key principle of adult learning. Yeah, most definitely. You've got to make it applicable, got to make it relevant to that group that's in front of you. And that may change as the day goes on, depending on your audience. Yeah? Most definitely. Do I simplify it? Do I make it more complicated? Am I sending the core message? Or am I going off message? You've got to think about all those sort of things. And we'll get you to do that today. And we'll steer you in the right direction. So you've got to think about how do I make it dynamic, <coughs> excuse me, without making it a bit sort of, you know, Billy Butlin's type thing, you know, a bit of a clown act, because it's not about that, because too much of one thing and you lose interest. Yeah, if I st st stand here and tell lots of jokes, some of you may like that, but if my message gets lost in all those jokes, then I I've, I've lost the session. Yeah? So you need to think about that. So everything is used in balance, humour, movement, all that type of thing, questions, and you need to give that some thought. Yeah? But you've still got to be quite dynamic about it. Welcome to the fourth session. We're going to do EG. It's a Friday afternoon. It's now half past four. Yeah, it's really hard to be dynamic, isn't it? Yeah? But somehow you've got to get over that hurdle and make it dynamic and make it interesting yeah? without being too silly about it. OK. Feel free to ask questions as we go through, please. I'm not um, worried about being interrupted as we go through. I'd rather ask the question as it pops into your head. Feel free to do that, although there is some time at the end for questions too. No problem at all. So adults learning, you as a group of adults learning today, will go around this circle. You'll do exactly this. You're quite predictable, really. It's a shame that I say that, isn't it? Because we like to think we're individual. But actually, as a group of learners and adult learners, you're quite predictable. What is your motivation for being here today, this side of the room? Somebody tell me why you're here. Like teaching? I've got your eye, you see. Everybody else is looking down. <laughs> Everybody else is looking away from me. Got your eye. So you like teaching. Generally like to teach. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so you generally like to teach, and this might help improve some of that. Brilliant. Great. Swells my heart as a clinical educator to hear that. Yeah. Anybody else on this side? I think I, I enjoyed the pet courses that I've been on. Okay. That's part of my motivation for wanting to teach and to okay. I guess do a good job. Good. So you enjoyed the pet courses, your, so your experience was a positive one. You thought, hmm, I'd actually like to get involved with this and teach it. And, and of course, the best way of keeping your knowledge up to date is to teach it. Absolutely. Yeah? <clears throat> good. So this side of the room, what's your motivation for being here? You want the skills you can Okay, so refine those skills, yeah? Good. OK, OK, so focus on the pet teaching elements. Yeah, and there might be something new that, that you learn here. I mean, my assumption is that many of you teach on a daily basis because of the level that you're at. It's an expectation that you will be teaching. Yeah, it's part of our code, isn't it, really? Yeah, so good. Anybody else? I think to understand more skills and what you really need to go on. OK. Sometimes you want to learn skills. OK, so you want... Understand new information. OK. So you want to add to your skill set. Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK, so the f you're acknowledging that there are different types of learners. And I guarantee there's probably about four different types of learners in this room, even just amongst this small group. So absolutely, how do I pitch my teaching to hit the learners? Some of you will be physical learners who like to do things, and I'm certainly in that category. My background is accident and emergency, so I like to get my hands in. I like to be doing it, and I learn by doing rather than by reading. Yeah? Some of you will be visual learners. You'll like pictures, you'll like that type of thing, you'll like to read things. So yes, you're absolutely right, so, and I've got to be aware of that to try and hit the learners in the room so you pick up something from it. So motivation is quite good. What about being sent on the course? What about if you're teaching someone who's been sent on the course. Does that affect motivation? You will go on the pet course. You know, hand up there at the back. 
that's a different motivator, isn't it? If you're the instructor or the teacher, whatever you want to call yourself, and you've got that group of people, that's different. Yeah? If people are being funded by their trust or paying for themselves, that's a different motivator. If I'm paying five, six, seven hundred pounds for a course, I want professional people standing here. I don't want some joker telling me lots of jokes. I want to learn about the subject matter. I want to be entertained, of course, because that's all part of adult learning. So again, that motivation is different, isn't it? So you need to consider that. Yeah? I do some work for the GMC uh, as an examiner and some other work for fitness to practice, but don't let that worry you. Yeah? I do some of that type of work. And sometimes we recommend these type of courses. If there's been an incident or something lacking in, in somebody's background, we would recommend a training course, potentially. So again, that's a different motivator, isn't it? Yeah? So it's worth thinking about. Worth thinking about how you might handle that as a teacher, that motivator. And especially during the end, towards the end of a day, yeah? When people are coming in, they're tired, they want to go home. It's worth thinking about, how am I going to motivate those people to learn this last bit, which might be the most important part, yeah? Okay, so let's come around the circle. Recognising practical application, that's that sort of application. Here's how you might use this. I'm going to teach you this because you might better use it in this situation. That's the hook, isn't it? Here's why it's worth listening to me. Yeah? So that's the helping people recognise where they might use it. And then give them a chance to practice it. Let's practice reading EEGs. Here's some strips to look at. Here's the points I was talking about, or you heard someone else talk about it earlier. So there's the theory. Now here's the practical station. So these courses link together. Think back to the pet days and the EEG and the headache training, etc. They all link, don't they? You get a bit of theory, then you get some practice. And that's important to make that connection. Yeah? Quite important to think about that and allow your candidates to practice those new skills where you can correct any bad behaviour or whatever and make sure that they walk out of the room with the right knowledge, the right contemporary behaviour if it's a skill you're trying to teach. Yeah? So it's worth thinking about how you might do that. What about positive reinforcement? How important is that for learning? It's really important, Andy. Yeah? How important is it? When was the last time someone said to you at work, thank you, that was a really good job you did today? Quick show of hands. Really like the way you handled those parents. <laughs> oh, okay. So how many of you thank your staff? Show of hands. How many of you say thank you to your staff? So all of the hands are going, well, there's all but one hand going up. <laughs> okay, half a hand. So there's a bit of a dichotomy there, isn't it? If you're not being told thank you, but you're doing lots of thanking, there's a space somewhere, isn't it? Something's not happening, isn't it? There's not a connection there, is there? So you need to think about that from the group of learners. Again, it's about balance about saying well done, yeah? The most important two words in the teaching language is well done, yeah? The least important I, yeah? It goes a thousand, thousand miles when you thank and you praise people for doing a job well. That's why we always show good practice. We never demonstrate bad practice because often that's the thing that's remembered because it's usually funnier, it's a bit more entertaining, <coughs> excuse me. So it's worth thinking about we all show good practice and we praise good practice. Well done, keep doing that, that's exactly right. That's exactly the right diagnosis, using that criteria, well done, et cetera, et cetera. So it's worth thinking about how you might do that. And again, it's about balance. It's about balancing. Too much and you step over that line and it becomes a bit strange, doesn't it? You know, well done, thank you so much. It gets a bit silly, doesn't it? So you need to think about that, how you might temper that. Yeah? Okay, show of hands. How many of you teach on a daily basis? Show of hands, just raise your hands in the air. Okay, how many of you teach on a sort of ad hoc basis? It may not be daily, but a bit ad hoc. Again, it should be the same people again, shouldn't it? And a couple more. Okay, how many of you don't teach at all? Okay, that's a shame, because people who don't teach are the easiest people to teach how to teach, because there's no bad habits. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so you're all teaching. Good. How many of you plan your teaching? Show of hands. Ah, uh, it's not the question I asked. Yeah? How many of you plan your teaching? Just let me see those hands again. Okay. How many of you sort of plan it? Depends on what you're asked to do. Maybe last minute, but it's something you can pull off the shelf because you've done it 30 times. Okay, so again, same hands should go up. How many of you don't plan your teaching? How many of you do it just off the cuff? Just, you know, how many of you do that? We had one grimace, so I'm guessing you probably have done in the past, yeah? If you're honest, you probably have done it. Okay. Let me tell you. Planned teaching is always, always, always more effective from the learner's point of view. 
If there are five objectives in our sessions, and you and I go into two different rooms to deliver the same session, as often happens with the groups, yeah? If I've planned my teaching, I've time managed, I've content managed, and I've thought about how I'm going to manage my audience, I will get through those five objectives by the end of my session. Yeah. If you don't plan your session, you'll get through three of them, and then the candidates will take you off at a tangent. You'll go off, and you won't get back, or you'll run out of time, or people won't get a chance to practice the skill that you'll be, you, you're supposed to be doing. So you need to think about that. I'm going to put a full stop in there, and I'm going to say to you there is a place for unplanned teaching. High fidelity areas where emergencies are coming through or there's something quite dynamic happening, absolutely there's a place for that. But I'd argue in your head you have a plan. If I'm going to teach you how to insert a chest drain, I'm going to think about the modality of teaching I'm going to use. I'm not going to use the four-stage approach to teaching that skill. I'm going to pop it in, right, I'm going to take it out, now I'm going to tell you what I've just done. I'm not going to use that modality to teach you, am I, in that situation. I'm going to use a different way of teaching you, aren't I? I'm going to think about the modality of teaching, and that's what today's about. Expose you to some of those modalities and see why some fit the skill or the knowledge that you're trying to achieve. So it's worth thinking about. So there is a place for unplanned teaching, absolutely. Yeah? Because I would argue if you're teaching something quite dynamic, there's a plan in your head. But you need to verbalise that plan to your learners. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to teach you in this situation. So people know what to expect from you. Adults like to know what we're going to get from you. Yeah? As you do. You want to know what you're going to get from me. Yeah? Okay. So you need to think about it. But planned teaching, ladies and gentlemen, is always more effective from the learner's point of view. And I've already told you I talk about the learner quite a lot because it's really about the learner. Definitely. Yeah? Okay, what about interaction? How important is that for adult learning? It's very important. Absolutely. Yeah? What am I trying to do to you this morning? <laughs> trying to interact? What am I doing to interact with you? What am I trying to do? Questions. questions? What type of questions? <laughs> Open questions. Ones you know the answers to, so quite simple questions, absolutely. Sometimes closed questions where there's a yes or no answer. Yeah, until we get to know each other better, until I get to know your depth of educational knowledge, as it were. And I don't want to go too deep. I'm not going to talk about educational theory and all that sort of stuff. It's too early in the morning, isn't it? Yeah, but I need, to I need to gauge where you are with that, don't I? From an educational point of view, which is where I'm coming from. So yeah, so I'm trying to ask you questions, ones you can answer. Because what does that help me do as a teacher? Engage. Engage, most definitely. Say again. Plan the rest of the, Plan the, rest of the teaching. See how you're, you're engaging with me. See what your reaction is to me. And you need to learn to trust me, don't you? And we're making those judgments, aren't we? As we go through this session, you're thinking, is he going to humiliate me any time now? And I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, we are not here to do that. We will not humiliate you. It's not what we're here for as a faculty. You'll do that for yourselves. Okay? And we will laugh with you, not at you. Okay? And guide you in the right, in the right direction. Absolutely. So we're making those judgments. Yeah? What else am I doing under this umbrella of interaction? What else am I trying to do? Focus attention. Okay. Focus attention on this material. You get the message across that this is about education. It's not necessarily about the pet material, etc., or EEG material. This is about education you as teachers, yeah? So I'm trying to change that focus for you. Anything else I'm doing to you? Sharing the experience. Sharing the experience, so yeah, so doing a little sharing. We call it trumpeting in education, and that's okay to do that, yes. Yeah, be careful how you say that, trumpeting. Yeah? It's, it's sort of blowing your own trumpet is the sort of colloquialism, if you like, and it's about sharing my experience with you, but again, balance. If I do too much of that, it's a bit showing off, isn't it? So you've got to get that balance right. And it's important that I get your experience and you get mine because it becomes real life and it becomes relevant, that key principle about learning, and it also becomes achievable. It means that you guys can achieve it in this day that we've got together, which is the third key principle of adult learning. So there's only three and there they are. So it's important to think about that. Yeah? What else am I doing to you in interaction? You're not feeling a thing because you're in learner mode. Yeah. What else am I doing to you? I'm doing it right now. Eye contact. eye contact, absolutely vital in adult learning. Yeah? And we're okay with this eye contact? You're quite happy? Yeah? What about if I step forward a little bit? 
<laughs> yeah, okay. So again, it's about balance, isn't it? I'm being flippant, but it's about balance. Eye contact's really important because it shows me that you're concentrating. It shows me you're either looking at the slides and the information, not being distracted, that type of thing. Yeah? So it's quite important that you do that. Anybody worried about eye contact? Let's say you're teaching a pet course with 32 candidates on it. Let's say you're one of a faculty of eight or nine or ten and you've never met them before. Anybody worried about that? Quick show of hands. Be honest. Yeah. Okay, so how do you, how do you look at 32 people? <laughs> Absolutely. It's about scanning very gently, just about scanning very gently. But if you're worried about that, what you can do is just look at the hairline. Just look at the forehead and the hairline. Just scan your audience. The audience think that you're looking at them, but until you get more confident, and then you can hold somebody's eyes. So there's a handy tip, and you're going to get lots of handy tips today as we go through. The faculty are very experienced in teaching and are good, excellent teachers. And I don't say that lightly because I see lots of teachers, yeah, and I do lots of assessment of teachers. So they'll give you lots of tips, and that's one of them. If you're worried about a big audience, just scan the hairline until you get more confident, then you can hold people's, people's eyes. Yeah? Quite powerful, isn't it, to do that? But again, it's about balance. Yeah? And it's about turning your body, so the nonverbal communication. Because if I want to shut this side of the room off now, I'm on this side of the room, my eye contact is here. It's very hard for these guys to keep talking to my back, isn't it? So it's a really good way of controlling this side of the audience, isn't it? So I've got absolutely no eye contact with them at all now, and that's quite powerful. The non-verbal communication is probably more powerful than you think. So it's worth becoming self-aware, not self-conscious, but self-aware. I know exactly what my body's doing right now. I'm very aware of how I'm using my hands, how I'm facing forward, I'm not hiding behind anything. We're a bit restricted because of the equipment, but actually you can see all of my communication. Words are roughly what, about 7%? Depends on the research you read. The rest of it, 93%, 95%, depends on the research papers you read. But all, more than three quarters of my communication is non-verbal, which is why I don't hide behind lecterns and things. I want you to see all of my communication as a teacher. I want to encourage you with, by using my hands and nodding and looking at my eyes. So it's worth thinking about. Yeah? It's much more powerful than you think. So I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through the day. Yeah? Okay. Interaction with your audience is really, really powerful, and adults like to be interacted with but you must give them permission to do so. As I did with you, please feel free to ask questions. I'm offering you the chance to ask questions, giving you permission to interrupt me. Yeah? You need to think about that. Yeah? And you can even do it in a five minute lecture, and you've prepared those for today. You can even do all of this stuff in that five minutes, I promise you. Yeah? Honest. <laughs> I can see your disbelief. I can see some of the disbelief in the eyes. I can see that. Okay? Worth thinking about how I'm going to do it, because it takes time, so you've got to plan it. It takes time. So if I ask you a question, I've got to pause, haven't I? I've got to pause and allow that question to sink in. Allow you then to have a bit of cognition to think about, am I going to answer that? What am I going to say? And that all takes time. So that has to be planned into your session. Yeah? Any questions so far about what I've said? Okay. So I'm going to get you to think about an experience that you've had as a learner, not as a teacher, but as a learner. And that could have been yesterday, it could have been five weeks ago, it could have been five years ago. And what I want, to, want you to do is just to work in pairs, if you would, and just write a list of descriptors down. So it could have been the food was good, the teacher was entertaining, the slides were great, or whatever it happens to be that described why that learning experience was positive. And then I'm going to ask you just to share one of those things off your list with a bigger group so we can start to learn from each other. Yeah? Is everybody happy with that? Everybody know, understand what I'm asking you to do? I'm going to give you five minutes to do that, yeah? And I'm going to bring you back together again. You can rearrange the chairs as you wish, but work in pairs and formulate that list. Okay. Yeah, so okay, ladies and gentlemen, get you to stop writing where you are now. <coughs> Okay, so what have I just done to you? See, learners never felt a thing. Fantastic. What have I just done to you? 
made you learn from each other, absolutely, so you're sharing that experience. We talk about experiential learning as, a, as an educational tool, and I would be foolish as a teacher, instructor, whatever you want to call me, not to use your experience in this room. I mean, you know, looking around the room without being rude, if we had a collective years of experience, good two, three hundred years, if we, if we add it up together, yeah, I don't mean that in a rude way. Yeah, but it's true, isn't it? So it'd be strange for me not to use that. So absolutely right. Let's get you using your experience with each other. Yeah, to share that. Yeah. Anything else I've done to you? Somebody else said something. Interacting. You're interacting. Absolutely. So it's trying to break down some of those barriers because you may not know each other. I know. You know this. Uh, pediatric neurologist is a small band of people, you know, nationally. So, but even so, you may have never come across each other before. So that breaks some of those barriers down. Absolutely. Anything else? Wake you up. Were you, were you falling asleep? <laughs> no one ever falls asleep in my lectures. Just in case. Yeah, Just in case. yeah but I know what you mean. What, what you really mean is I've changed the dynamic in the room. This classic sort of lecture format where I'm standing at the front and spouting forth hopefully doesn't feel too formal because I'm asking you to interact with me so it's less formal than a classic lecture modality of teaching. But yeah, but I need a rest from you, you need a rest from me. So that's exactly how we can do that in the confines of this space, of this room. I can change the modality. So from classic lecture format to closed discussions, to group work. And you can't get a much smaller group than two, can you? Yeah? 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 Sometimes it's called a gossip. Yeah? But I try not to. But uh, I could have broken you, broken you into your, your groups, your A, B, and C. But it may be that you don't know that yet. You've not quite looked at the paperwork and see which group you're in. So that would cause me more trouble and take more time. So I made a choice. I'm going to, at the beginning of my session, I'm going to break you into pairs because that will be easier. So I, I've designed that, if you like. So I've thought of it ahead of time rather than just on the hoof. Yeah? Um, okay, so it's worth thinking about. How am I going to do this? Yeah? Because your attention span is what? Now be polite. <laughs> I can see you're going to be trouble. Yeah? What does the research suggest? It's about 20 minutes, isn't it? About 20 minutes. And then every 20 minutes or so, you should change the dynamic in the room. So change the modality or do something or ask questions or put a quiz up or, or do something. Yeah, and you need to think about that. If my session is 40 minutes long, that means there's one change in there somewhere. If it's an hour long, that's three changes. So every 20 minutes, I should do something a little bit different just to gain your attention again. Because as we know, it starts off really high, the attention, then it dips down, and then it comes back up again. Yeah? So it's worth making sure that as it starts to dip down, you change it so it starts off high again. Yeah? So it's just worth thinking about. Think about the session you've got yeah? to do. OK, I asked you to do uh, an exercise to think about a positive learning experience you've had yeah, as the learner, not as the teacher. And you've made some lists of those. And I suggested I was going to give you five minutes to do that. Did I give you five minutes? Show of hands who thinks I gave you five minutes. Okay show, a, okay, show a hand who don't think it was five minutes or a bit unsure, think, thinks it was less. Okay, more, okay. Who doesn't understand the question? <laughs> okay, so not every hand went up in this room. <laughs> okay, I gave you exactly five minutes. So what does that prove to you as a teacher, as, as a potential pet or instructor or EEG? When I say pet instructor, I, I encompass all of the EEG, et cetera, et cetera, headache and all the rest of it. What does that prove to you? That you've got to? Certain structure. Certain structure and timing is crucial. Time management is crucial. Yeah? Okay, here's a bit of insightful behavior. Hands up if your time management is fairly poor. Yeah? So hands going up. Good. So recognizing the problem is halfway there, all right, as they say. So you need to think about that because on these type of courses you can't run over. This is about core material ladies and gents, it's core material that brains have sat around a table thinking this is the core material that we need to know. We need to know. Not what's good to know or nice to know because that takes more time. You can do that in the coffee breaks and lunch breaks but actually the core material is what we're teaching. So you need to think about that. Yeah? Time management is crucial. I gave you exactly five minutes. So you need to start thinking. You're working in pairs. Why didn't one of you say, okay, get, let's have a time warning. Let's keep an eye on time. So you, so you need to start to think about that. You'll see the faculty do it to each other. We give each other time warnings. And I'll get a time warning when I know I'm five minutes from the end of this because that's where I should be heading into my closure. You've read your little blue handbooks, medical instructor's handbook for teaching. Yeah? First chapter talks about set, dialogue, and closure. Yeah, exactly. That's the structure that works really well. And I commend it to you for teaching. It'll get, a, get you out of trouble every time, that structure. 
If your session's going completely haywire and you're losing control, if you hang on to that set dialogue and closure, it'll get you out of trouble every time. Very simple, but it works extremely well. It really does. I do commend it to you. Okay, so you need to think about that, the structure, the timing, the content management. How much can I say here? Because you guys know a lot. And if you know a lot, in my experience of teaching for the last 30 years, if you know a lot, you want to say a lot. And we don't have time for that. It's core material. But what do I need to know to enable me to look after paediatric epilepsy, to interpret an EEG? What do I need to know? Not what's good to know or nice to know, but what do I need to know? And that's how they're designed. So it's, it's no slight on your teaching or your knowledge base. It's not about that. It's about, here's the time frame we've got. We've got 40 minutes. There's 40 minutes worth of content being designed to go into that 40 minutes. So you need to think about how you're going to deliver that yeah? in that way and still be a personality. Yeah? We're not trying to change your personality, but we know that these modalities work. And you've heard Tim already say there's a consistency in the teaching, and that's what people like about these courses. It's constant. It's a high standard. And that comes because we're all doing the same thing and all saying the same thing and all reading from the same page. Yeah? We're not robots, but we buy into that. If you want to be an instructor, you buy into it. If you don't, then don't play the game. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, good. So I've asked you to do the exercise now, so let's have your positive learning experiences then. So from this side of the room, who'd like to give me something from your list that made it a positive experience for you? Just give me one thing off your list. Nice and loud so everybody else can hear you. There was a lot of humor used in one of the teaching sessions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it was about NLS. There was lots of positive reinforcement from the NLS, lots of humour being used, and the instructor throwing chocolates. So he's meeting lots of actually sort of lower level needs, doesn't he? That sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know? The warmth, the comfort, the belonging, yeah. the food. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of lower needs being met. Absolutely. So it's something different that you've remembered. Yeah? So lots of humour. As long as it doesn't detract from the message, then absolutely. You know, if you're naturally funny, then use it. Use it as a tool, but don't detract from the message. Yeah? It's like slides and things. If you have too many of them, it detracts from the message. Yeah? If I have lots of movement on here, it takes it away from the message. Yeah? So you're absolutely right. So it's about thinking, well, how can I put this in but balance it? Yeah? I'll use a bit of humour. And I go, it's got to be appropriate humour these days, hasn't it? You know? People are waiting to be offended, aren't they? Yeah? In fact, some of you will be offended by that. <laughs> But it's true, isn't it? You've got to be quite careful how humour is used, and especially when we take the courses abroad and stuff, because the humour isn't always the same, and you may say, be a bit flippant and say something that, that has no intention to, you know, to insult anybody, and it, sometimes it just happens accidentally. Yeah? And if you make a mistake, hold your hands up and say, as a teacher, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm learning all the time. You know, I learn from you, you'll learn from me. Yeah? So it's about putting your hands up and saying, sorry, I made a mistake. That wasn't my intention. It wasn't what I meant to say, or, or to be perceived even. Because it is about perception, isn't it? Yeah, I can't control how you perceive me. I can only do so much. OK, come on in. Perfect timing. Perfect timing because actually movement always distracts the learner. Always. You can't help it. Way back in our caveman days, way back in the old brain somewhere, movement equals food and or survival. So the human eye is always attracted to movement, which is why we've closed the curtains here so you can't see the traffic. Because I know that the traffic going past will be more interesting than what I'm saying about education. <laughs> the cat that walks across that lawn outside your window will be more exciting than what you're saying about paediatric epilepsy. You, we can't help ourselves. Yeah? So as a teacher, I am trying very hard to make sure that your back's away from the movement, the door to come in and out of the room is behind you. Yeah, I've shut the curtains, so I'm trying to minimise all those distractions. Yeah? Can't always get rid of all of them. I know you can see through those cracks in those two curtains there. I'm aware of that. Yeah? But you need to minimise it. This is all distraction. I've taken this away. Because that's a considered, considered movement. So you need to think about it. Yeah? Even just sitting there, even just, doing, even just doing that, that's considered movement. I can't help but want to look at it, even though I'm in control of it and I know it hasn't moved. And you can't help yourself but look at it. Yeah? So you need to think about that in your session. So if I take it away by hitting the B button, B for blank out the screen, B for bring it back. Yeah, there's another handy tip if you haven't learned that one. 
distract, it takes away that extra distraction. Quite useful, isn't it? Because I'm the best audiovisual aid I've got, aren't I? All these things enhance what I do. They don't drive what I do. I've prepared for you because I value your time. I also value my time, so I, you can see I've prepared. That gives you as a learner some value. Yeah? But they don't, they, don't drive, they, only drive, they don't really drive what I do. They enhance what I do. Because this will let me down, won't it? There'll be a power cut. Or we're in the middle of Kenya, and the generator will go. Been there, done that. Trying to run an NLS course, in fact. Yeah? And somehow you've got to keep delivering something meaningful to your audience. Yeah? I am the best audiovisual aid I've got. If I've prepared well, I'm confident, I'm comfortable with material, I know how I'm going to present it, I can get over any of these hurdles. Yeah? Yes, Andy. <laughs> okay, so thank you for that. Really powerful. Okay, so thank you. Your timing was perfect, and thank you for that comment about the, the humor and that sort of stuff. Okay, guys at the back, want to add to that list? Sure. It's, it's quite, a, it's quite a, a lovely position to be in as an observer, isn't it? Because there's no stress on you. You can see both sides of the story, as it were. You can see the, the learners, you can see the teachers. It's quite powerful, isn't it? And we do recommend, actually, for many of these courses, um, that, you, that you, if you can, we know time is absolutely critical for us in the NHS these days and, and other places. But if you can observe a course, it actually adds, I think, something to it and prepares you almost for when you go and teach, you can see what some of the, the good teaching was and what some of the pitfalls are. Yeah? So I think it's a really unique position, so that's really powerful. Yeah, and I'm glad it was positive for you, I really am. And I'd recommend that if you get a chance to do that before you teach on your first one, if you get the chance, I know it's difficult, um, observe other people doing it or half a day or something. It will really help you, it really will. So thank you for that. Okay. Enough praise? Is that enough praise or would you like a little bit more? <laughs> thank you so much. So it goes over that line to become a bit creepy, doesn't it? Yeah? So again, it's all about balance, isn't it? It's all about balance. Okay, good. Okay, guys from the side of the room, you want to add something different to that list? The positive learning experience that you've had? I went to send it to a course that was a reflection and feedback. Okay, refresher on feedback. So it's a reflection and feedback. Oh, reflection and feedback, okay. Sorry. It's okay. And the presenter was named Paul Kenton. All right, okay. Really? <laughs> it wasn't me, was it? <laughs> Okay, yeah. So 300 people in the audience, okay? Yeah. But he was so comfortable. Okay, so he was doing the hairline thing, yeah, okay, with 300 people, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so he was giving you, he was sharing those personal experience with you to show how it would work and trying to make that connection. So you think, oh yeah, I could actually do that. Absolutely, and that's really quite powerful, isn't it? Again, <coughs> excuse me, they need to be sort of limited so you're not showing off. And I need to get you to share your experience as well, which is why, I, in fact, I said to you, how many of you teach? It's a very simple way of getting you to share that experience. <coughs> show of hands. Yeah, 300 people is quite a big audience, isn't it? Uh, I think the biggest audience I've ever stood in front of is 3,000 people at a conference. Can I interact with 3,000 people? What do you think? Show of hands who think I can. Okay, show of hands who think I can't. Who doesn't understand the question? <laughs> Who's not sure? What have I just done to you? Made, a stick, made, a stick. made you think, raised your hands. I've just interacted with you. So, 3,000 people, how many of you teach on a daily basis? 2,000 hands go up. How many of you teach on an ad hoc basis, a bit every now and then? 500 hands go up. I'm interacting with my audience. It's just a different way of interacting. If you can interact one-on-one, -on -one, you can interact one-on-one -on -one thousand. It's very easy. You just have to adapt the way that you're interacting. Yeah? You've got the eye contact. 300 is probably too many for eye contact, probably the first couple of rows before the lights go a bit dim. Yeah? But actually, if you feel special, it's because that person on the, on the stage has made you feel as if I'm talking just to you in that group of 300. You make the connection. Yeah? So you're absolutely right about giving some experience. And it's about matching it and marrying it with all those other techniques. Definitely. So good. And it's worth thinking about. How can I, what can I share that makes the connection with my audience? Yeah? It's like EEG reading. If you've never seen one of those before, it, it looks like nothing, does it? It just looks like a, 
What is that? Or if you've got minimal input into that. So if someone says to you, when I first started reading these, I found it really difficult. You've made that connection with me as a new learner on EEGs. You've made that connection immediately. You've taken some of that pressure away. But I'm, what I'm going to show you is six easy ways of working it out. That's what I'm here to teach you. Whew, I'm going to have a system. So you can see how you make those connections, yeah, just by giving your own experience. Very powerful. Good. Anything else? Anybody else want to add? As you said, movement, oh. movement attracts. Sorry. Movement, yeah. Attracts yeah. So okay. Using audiovisual okay. slides, yeah. illustrations, cartoons, whatever, just to attract attention. And okay. So it's about movement, so it's using them and thinking about how you're going to use them. And think about this movement. Yeah? It's about being encouraging, about bringing you in, about keeping you quiet, about stopping you. Yeah, without being rude. So I'm using my body language. Okay, thank you very so much. And I change the eye contact, change my body position. It's very hard for you to keep doing this, isn't it, if I'm not looking at you. So it's, it's very powerful. It's worth thinking about. So it's a good point. Yeah? But again, use it sparingly. When PowerPoint first came out and keynotes and all these things, yeah, they had things flashing in, flashing out, turning around, we had things clapping, all sorts of things going on. And actually, it distracts, doesn't it? Because you're thinking, what's the next thing that's coming on the next slide? How's that going to come in? Yeah, you're not thinking about the material. So it's, again, it's about balance. So it's a good, very good point. And you're going to say finally. Yeah. Okay, so video clips, and we use quite a lot of those in the pet courses, don't we? Some better than others, but some of, some of those syndromes are quite hard to capture, aren't they? And especially the rarer ones, most definitely. Video clips, case studies are very powerful. So the closed discussions will have case studies in because that makes it a bit more real for you. That's what you come across. You're coming across patients on a daily basis. So absolutely, so it's thinking about those. How am I going to structure this session? How can I get the best from it? And if you're going to add or detract something, you need to let your course directors know, I've got something that I can add to this. As long as it doesn't take you over your time or detract from the message that we're trying to send, the core message. But talk to the course director. I've seen something, I've got a little something here that just might be really useful. But make sure you talk to the course organisers and directors before you do it. You know? Because everything's timed, as you know. Think back to your own course. It's a bit, isn't it? Yeah? It's a bit like being in one of those forced through a mincer, isn't it? You know? <clears throat> because they're so well structured, because we've got limited time with you, because you're expensive people to have in this room. Aren't you? And when you're teaching others, they're expensive people to have in that room too. So you've got to make it worthwhile. Yeah? Exactly. So it's a good point, a very good point. So it's thinking about how am I going to make this much more interesting for the learners and the different learner types. And we've already mentioned the different learner types in the room. Yeah? Okay. Good. So thank you for that. That's the end of that exercise. But lots of positive stuff going on there, isn't it? That list is probably quite long, and I expect most of you have got the same on those lists. Yeah? The candidates that you stand in front of will want all of those things on your list. They want you to be all of those things. Tall order? Hands up if you still want to be an instructor. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, thought so. Okay, so thank you for that. So, okay, ladies and gents, you've read the blue book. I'm just going to scan the eyeballs because you can keep your body language very still and neutral, but your eyes give you away every time. Yeah, you've read the blue book. Chapter one talks about set dialogue and closure, doesn't it? Yeah, where am I now? You should recognise where I am. I'm heading into my closure, aren't I? Because yeah, I know I've got about 12 minutes left. <clears throat> yes? So I'm heading into my closure. So there's some structure to this closure, isn't there? There's questions, summarising, and then there's the termination. And they're quite important that you do that, all the, in, those order, in those orders. Why do we do it in that order? Why do we do it in that order, do you think? Questions, summary, termination. Okay, so it's, it's questions of a clarification only, absolutely. We're not introducing new information at this point because we're closing everything down. Because in the main meat of the delivery, we've delivered the message, yeah? So absolutely right, so it's for clarification only, yeah? Good, and then we summarise because I want you to hear my voice last. My take-home message is the most important thing in this session, not the difficult question I couldn't answer or whatever, yeah? Or the the smart person in the room who's trying to prove something, yeah? And you'll always get those people, and we'll show you how to handle some of those as we go through the day, yeah? Because the most important message is my message, the take-home message, the core message from the course, from this session, yeah? Absolutely, which is why we do it in that order. 
So there's some rules when we get here, though. There's some rules about any questions. When I ask this question, are there any questions, I need to be quite careful, don't I? Not only with my non-verbal communication and my body language, but also with the words I use. Yeah? OK. Are there any questions? <laughs> now, I'm being flippant, but what is this telling you? Wondering. Yeah, please don't ask me any or whatever. Absolutely. I'm sort of cl very closed or whatever. It doesn't quite match, does it? Yeah? What about this? Are there any questions? A bit more relaxed? I've got rid of one hand. Yeah? Because sometimes it's really a bit unnerving. Where do, where do I put my hands? When you start thinking about your body language, you become a bit wooden, don't you? Yeah? Especially when I walk into the room and I start watching you, as I will. You, what do I do with my hands? So to be able to get one hand out of the way is OK, isn't it? But just be careful. Don't make sure there's no coins or keys. Make sure your pockets are empty. Because if you start jangling things, it looks very strange from there. OK? So just be careful. OK? Make sure there's nothing in. But that gets rid of one hand. You've only got one hand to worry about. Yeah? This is quite a good gesture, isn't it? I use this because I used to touch my tie lots of times. When I did my teacher training and you get videoed lots of times, I used to touch my tie. Completely unaware I was doing it. It's like people who click pens. Completely unaware they're doing it. Yeah? But you've got to take control of that because it's distracting. It's noise. It's a movement. It'll distract you. Yeah? So I do this now. I use this on two occasions. One, I'm really interested in what you're saying. And the second is, I'm absolutely bored at my brain, but you'll never know the difference. You'll, I'll never give it away, because I, I keep neutrality in my face. So you'll never know. <laughs> okay. So it's worth thinking about, what, what gestures do I normally use, and can I use them to my advantage? Because that's the whole point. This is another tool in the teacher's toolkit, body language, most definitely. What about this? So I say, OK, ladies and gents, are there any questions? You think it's too casual, OK. You're OK with it? Yeah? You like what you're seeing? <laughs> I'm being flippant, but this is about being quite vulnerable, isn't it? Because for us men, we tend to look at any, any footballers when they're about to line that wall. Yeah? We sort of protect ourselves, as it were. So that's quite a vulnerable pose, isn't it, for a guy? It's quite vulnerable. But it means, ask me questions. I'm not scared. Bring it on. I'm not scared. Because yeah, I know how to handle the questions. And they may not have an answer, but I know how to handle the question. So when I pose the question, are there any questions, I need to put a caveat on it, because what's the danger? Are there any questions? What's the danger? Any, any question can be asked. Anything can be asked. So if somebody asks me a difficult question that I can't answer, if it's about paediatric neurology, fire away. Yeah. Ask me something I can't answer. Go for it. What did you have for breakfast this morning? That's a really interesting question. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Anybody in the room? <laughs> Any ideas? Toast? Are we just guessing or do you know for a fact? <laughs> We're just guessing. OK. Yeah? So we don't know? OK, faculty, what did he have for breakfast this morning? That's a really good question. We don't know the answer to that. Do you have the answer to that? No. You've forgotten. <laughs> OK, well, we'll find out for you. We'll go and ask the staff and we'll find out for you. OK, so you can see what I've done there. OK, so I've asked a question. I've left myself wide open to having any sort of question that I can't answer. But what I've done is I've paraphrased the question so everybody hears the question. Because sometimes it's difficult, isn't it? This has got a fan on it, fan on it, yeah, the air conditioning's on. Yeah, exactly. So it's quite difficult to hear those. So paraphrasing the question or paraphrasing any answers you get, as you've watched me do this morning, means what I'm doing is reinforcing the material, reinforcing the right answers. Yes? So I, re so I paraphrase the question so you all hear it. Yeah, throw it out to you. He's asked me, I don't know the answer to the question. I've acknowledged that. If I start to try and guess, you know my credibility is going to go, credibility is really fragile, isn't it? You've got to keep working with your credibility because you can lose it at any stage. And this is the point where I may have delivered a really good session. Lots of interaction, lots of humour, lots of stuff from you. And then suddenly, because I muck up at the end, <coughs> credibility disappears. So paraphrase the question, throw it open to the audience. I've already said there's 300 years experience in this room, haven't I? In fact, we've got a bit more now because we've got two more people in. So 350 years experience between us now. Yeah. So there's lots of experience here, so throw it out to the audience. If they don't know the answer, I'm going to the next level, which is the faculty. Because you're going to get difficult questions you can't answer. It's guaranteed. Yeah? Faculty, what do you think? OK. 
They don't know the answer. I need to now acknowledge it's a really good question. It's a really good question. We don't know the answer. I need to come back to you, don't I? Because most questions asked in an open forum by adults, they already know the answer to. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Anybody think about that? Some of the questions you've been asked in some of these conferences and presentations you've done? Yeah. A high percentage of the, of the questions that the questioner already knows the answer. So I'll come back to you. And you should give us the answer, which I'll then paraphrase. But if you don't know the answer, fine. I can acknowledge it. Right, I'll find out for you. Stroke your ego. Well done, that's a really good question. Yes? So you can see how that works. And then make sure that I do come back to you and come back to all of you. So in the coffee break or the next time we're able to say, right, the answer to that question was toast. Yeah? So you can see how that works. Yeah? I can caveat it though, can't I? I can get away from that danger by saying, are there any questions about adult learning, the stuff we've just talked about this morning? I'll bring it right in, don't I? Yeah? Are there any questions about this EEG session? and the six factors we take into account, or whatever, yeah? Bring it right down so people have got, haven't got anywhere to go with it. Because it's about clarification, that's really the reason you're asking. And you must ask it. So in your five minute session, you should leave one minute to do that. To do your closure, questions and closure. In an hour's lecture, it should be the last five minutes or so. Yeah? So you need to plan that in. Yeah? And plan in the time. Because when I say to you, are there any questions, I need to allow about eight seconds for you to think, what's he just said? Oh, are there any questions? Yes, I do have a question, and then verbalize it. It takes roughly six to eight seconds. So I need to allow that time. Only the first time I ask it. If I now ask, are there any further questions, I only have to wait a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. Yeah? Not another eight. Does that make sense? Okay. So, with that in mind, are there any questions about adult learning, the stuff we've talked about? We will add to this as we go through the day, I promise. But are there any questions so far? Oh, fantastic. Eight seconds. Well done. Okay, who wasn't counting, by the way? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we talk about us being instructors, but you're asking about the material that we're being asked to present. The material has been thought about by big brains who've sat around a table saying, this is the need to know stuff. Yeah? And so what you do is you'll be sent those ahead of time so you can practice with them. Have a look at them. The material is, is didactic. How we deliver it isn't. We're offering you some modalities that we know work, but actually the material is what we've agreed should be taught. Yeah. So the slides are quite efficient in that. And if you use them and you watch your timing, because you don't have to say everything that's on the slide. The material on any slide is for, you've seen my slides, it's just to remind me what I need to talk about. The bullet points for me to remind me. You're the expert standing here. So you don't have to say everything on there. So they're, they're quite efficient, but what they do is they remind you of what you need to talk about or what needs to be included in the session. Does that make sense to you? Or not quite. I can see it doesn't quite answer your question. So just expand your question. Okay. 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 Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. We are going to talk a little bit more about that. So just to repeat that question again, it's about do they need to be simple? Do they need to be fancy? What's the power of using slides? Slides are very, very powerful. We're either with a picture or with simple words. The less on the slide, the more effective they usually are. The danger that people make is they cover the slides and they become less effective. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about lecturing. So we, that leads very nicely into the next session. So I don't want to take away from that. But absolutely, slides are very important. And I would say to you, less is more. If you understand that term, use less words, less slides, much more powerful. You're the expert. You're making the connection with the human beings, not this. This just enhances what you, excuse me, it just enhances what you do. Yeah? Okay. And I'll add to that in the next session, I promise. Okay. Any further questions then, guys, before we close? Can I ask, um, uh, in uh, because these are very structured uh, sessions sure. of, the, of the PET courses, and 
and you have to keep to time. You just have to keep to the core material that you have planned to deliver. Absolutely. But if you've got an audience who are who may be quite experienced, maybe for a low level course, yeah, and you may feel that they they know all of this, you know, most of them did and, or most of it. Okay. How do you keep them interested? And uh, you you are at a risk of you know losing them. Yeah, okay. Sort of so there's lots of questions in there, isn't there? Really about having a high level audience, a lower level course. Okay, and you're at the risk of losing them if they already know it. The thing to do is not to make any assumptions. You know, it's that to gauge that, or that, that reaction. So I'm going to talk about X. How many of you got experience of X? Get the show of hands going. Yeah, if nobody puts hands up, then okay, you know where you're coming from. But if lots of hands go up, okay, you can say, okay, that's great. Uh, some of this will be revision for you then. Uh, please stick with me. Um, I, but I, I, I absolutely assure you, you'll learn something new in here. Hook them in. Yeah? And actually, you may have read this. You may have read this material. I've made reference to the pocket guide, to the, to the blue handbook that you've, that you've read. Yeah? And I've made reference to that. If you haven't read it, that's not my fault. You're adult learners. You make that choice. Yeah? So all, all I can do is make reference to it, and that empowers the course. So you can say to people, OK, I, I, um, I absolutely accept that you may already know some of this material. But I'll run through it and I'll try and get some of your experience. So you're engaging the audience. About engaging the audience and getting that interaction, that's when you'll keep them, on, keep them with you, by engaging them, most definitely. If you talk at them, you'll lose them. Yeah? Does that make sense to you? Yeah? So even though they may be of a higher level, you can't make the assumption they all know this. Yeah? I know that if we need basic life support doing, I don't call the consultant. I call the staff nurses, because they're brilliant at it. And when that fails, they call in expert help. That's where the consultant comes in. It's a higher level. Does that, does that make sense? So that's how I try and think about it. Okay, I'm bringing people into a pet course. They may know some of this stuff, may not know it all. And they may not know it in this structured format that we're offering them. And what I sometimes do as well is to say, this will be a structure for you to help you teach it. There's a different angle there, isn't there? So it's trying to find a different angle to, to bring them in. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. You can only try your best. You can't please everybody all of the time as a teacher. You won't. All you can do is think about how you might are presenting this. Yeah? And it may be you start to share experiences. OK, you've put your hand up. You said you've got lots of experience in this. Give me an example of X. You've got them engaged then. People like to give, you, give ex experiences, don't they? Yeah? So you're just adapting your session to fit your audience. Because yeah? they still need to know the material. They're on the pet course. Make, make no apology for that. Yeah? I mean, you know we put people through pet one before they go into pet two. Absolutely accept that. It's about how you present and how you interact. OK, we'll add to this as we go through, I promise. So adult learning, key principles, ladies and gentlemen. There they are. Applicability, can you make it applicable to your audience? Is it relevant to the level they're at? Can you make that connection with them? And can they achieve it? Can they achieve what you're asking them to do? If you can answer yes to those three elements, then you have an effective learning session taking place. OK, so that's the end of that session. And I think we're moving straight into the first demonstration, which will be lecturing. So that's the end of that. So take a breather. Okay. And after this session, we'll then go for coffee. Okay. So we're going to talk about lecturing. And lecturing is quite an important modality for teaching still. It sort of comes in and out of vogue, that, that modality of teaching. It's slightly out of vogue at the moment, but it still has, a, still has a place. Why is it important, do you think, lecturing as a modality? What's the positive side of that particular type of teaching? You can cover a big audience. You can cover a big audience, absolutely. Yeah, one instructor, hit the whole audience, yep. Yeah. Guaranteed to deliver that core material that you want to. Deliver. Okay, so you can make sure you're delivering the core material so everybody's getting the same message at the start of a course or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other advantages to, to lecturing? Okay, so you can give elements of theory. Absolutely. And it can reinforce pre reading material, can't it? Yeah, it can reinforce that. Yeah. It's cost effective. The rest of the faculty are getting rooms ready for teaching, closed discussions, skill stations, while there's one instructor here. Absolutely, it can be quite cost effective. Yeah? 
What's the disadvantages of that type of modality then, lecturing? It's a disadvantage. It's more one way. It can be more one way. I mean, I'm hoping you didn't feel that this morning. It's billed as a lecture, the adult learning, but hopefully it's a bit more interactive than that because I gave permission to do that and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, but it can be, can't it? Be quiet. And you're stunned by what being, you're being hit with. Yeah, okay, so it can be one way. Any other disadvantages? Information, Information overload, absolutely. Yeah, you can have too much stuff on the slides, or I'm going to say too much, I'm trying to ram too much into the short space of time, most definitely. Any other disadvantage? Attention span. Attention span, yeah, because how long are lectures normally? Hours and hours. <laughs> well, there may be a series of lectures where there's no breaks in between. Yeah? And how long can you sit and be polite for? Three hours, three and a half hours, when you've just been bombarded with information? It's quite difficult, isn't it? Yeah, so it can be absolutely difficult. So we try and use them sparingly, or we adapt them so they're a little bit more interactive. So just because it's billed as a lecture doesn't mean to say you have to do the classic format. Yeah? It's about being interactive. Yeah? And giving your audience permission to do things. Please feel free to ask questions and interrupt me as we go through. Because actually, as an audience, you don't know whether you can do that or not. You'll sit politely. I won't ask a question. And I'd rather answer a question that's in your head as we go through, rather than leaving the burden of the questions till the end, where I've only, I know I've only got a few minutes left. Yeah? And it makes it a much more interactive session. So think about how you might break some of those rules. Yeah? Education is it's not an exact science. Okay, there are some really good theories that work very well, but actually you can interchange the modalities, you can interchange what you do. And the essence of a, of a good teacher, an effective teacher, is about being adaptive. Can I adapt to what's going on? Do I need to bring it down a level? Do I need to take it up a notch? Yeah? To my audience. Because you don't know your audience's reaction until you start. I've got to be adaptive. Yeah, to you. Yeah, so we're still using lecturing. It is still quite a powerful modality, usually with slides or a case study or something like that. And we're just going to show you a demonstration now. And Helen is going to give a demonstration of a five-minute lecture. Now, this is relevant to you and applicable to you, yes, because you're going to be doing this this afternoon. Yeah, and we'll pick up any selling points afterwards so you've got time to make any corrections or changes that you wish. Yeah, so Helen's going to do that. What I'm also going to do for Helen is give us some feedback. Now, we're using a new style of feedback in education. We've been using it in simulation suites for many years, but it's the learning conversation style of feedback. Now, this may be new to you. Those of you who instruct on NLS or APLS or those resuscitation courses will be using this new style. We've moved away from that Pendleton sandwich, that adapted Pendleton model. So we do a learning conversation now. So I will do that for Helen. I'll give her some feedback on her lecture, as we will do for you this afternoon because it's all about learning, and feedback is another learning episode. Yeah? And then we'll pick up the salient points from both those elements. Is that okay? Yeah? Feel free to move around, guys, if you need to move so you can see. But focus on Helen. And what I want you to do is focus on Helen as the instructor. Try not to get too bogged down in the core material. Think about her as an instructor. Think about set, dialogue, closure. What would you do? How would you change it? What would, how would you interact with the audience? Yeah? And then we'll pick up those points afterwards. Yeah, everybody okay with that? Everybody happy with that? Okay, Helen, thank you. <clears throat>